Welcome to another edition of Journey Hope. Real stories of people going through life. Life is a journey with many twists and turns and unexpected things that come along. Our special guest today is Vern Haas from OMAC, Washington, up in the northern part of Washington. Vern, we're glad you're here and able to take part in this journey of hope. And our listening audience from all around the world, they want to know a little bit about you. So where are you from? Where were you raised? I was raised in a little town of Heartline, Washington, in Washington State, a uh, population of a little over 100 people. 100 people. Now, where, uh, is, where is that? This where is, is 30 miles southwest of Grand Coulee Dam. Okay. That gives and it a little my, bit of idea. My father had worked at Grand Coulee from 1934 right after it started till. Uh, 1962 when he did he help build was, it or was he working there he or? was a blacksmith at there working there and, and worked there during that period of time okay so you, uh, did so you grow up in Heartland then or? yes yes all right went to school I went mean 100 to, kids I mean 100 people in the in the city where'd you go to school uh, in Heartline uh, at the time now it's a com combined school but uh, I had one of the largest graduating classes that had ever gone through, and there was nine of us. Nine? <laughs> it was a <the> hard, <laughs> right. large graduate. Is that from the eighth grade? Yes, our, yeah, from the eighth our, grade. Our uh, high school population was 30. Really? So, now, did you go to high school there also? Yes. Okay, well, you tell me something very interesting that something that started really early in your life, about the age of six. When I was in the sixth grade, uh, I. Uh, we were not uh, a well-to-do family, so I was always out working uh, where I could and whatnot. And they had a position to take care of the local cemetery, which was basically watering and, and mowing weeds. You're talking about the cemetery, cemetery and the grounds? Yes. And so I started doing that, and uh, uh, before long I was digging graves and, and what, whatever else needed to be done. Yeah, and are you talking about it again in Heartland here? This this was at Heartline, about a half a mile uh, west of or east of town. Okay. And so, uh, I decided back early that uh, I wanted to be a funeral director and drive one of those big funeral coaches and, <laughs> and cars. And so, uh, that was my goal from this that the, point the on. This is the sixth grade. You began working. I mean, I've worked a lot of different jobs, but I never ever worked in a in a cemetery and you were maintaining the grounds and occasionally got involved in actually digging digging for the graves. Right. Is that a, yeah. is that Opening a fact? and closing the so graves. So at a very early age you had this burden and a kind of a vision that you wanted to become a, a funeral director. So right. what happened? As soon as I graduated from high school, the requirements at that time was two years of college, two years of apprenticeship, and nine months, which has now been changed to at least one year of mortuary school. So um, I immediately went to Spokane and uh, went to school at Eastern Washington College just out of Spokane. Uh, now what was, were you studying at this point? Uh, very, just a general Liberal course. Liberal arts? Just, it, but, but with the emphasis more on anatomy. Okay. And so I, uh, as I uh, Got into school, I was able to get a job at, at one of the funeral homes in Spokane. Because you had and, this dream and a right. vision, to, so you, you got a, a part-time job. Right. Uh, I worked nights. Uh, we answered the phone. We, they had an ambulance, so we made uh, various calls, both uh, for death calls and ambulance really? calls. And uh, so I did my apprenticeship as I was doing my college education. I mean, education. were you involved in actually picking up some of the bodies and yes. bringing them back to the yep. funeral? And were you? Working with the embalmer. And so this was almost you know, like an apprenticeship It was, you yes. Okay. So it's and you're still going to college at the same time? That's right. This is but I was basically job. working nights, uh, working nights for there. the funeral home. Okay. Uh, as soon as I had my two years of apprenticeship uh, finished and, and my college uh, I went away to Cincinnati, to Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science. And, so is that one of the main places that, in the country, or that's where you went It was went one anyway. of the main places for, for Cin mortuary school. Cincinnati, Ohio? Yes. Okay. And uh, completed my nine months of school there, came back home, and came back to the same funeral home, actually, and worked for them for a couple, three years. And yep. is that where near Spokane now? In Spokane, in Spokane. North, Spokane. north end right. of Spokane. Okay. All right. So. And what were you uh, doing that, at that point? Were you like an assistant director or? 
uh, assistant director, embalmer. Uh, embalmer, so you got yeah. involved in the bombing? Did oh, you, yes. When you went to Cincinnati, is this where you learned the embalming? Is, yes, is I, the, I, I actually learned how from one of the uh, embalmers and funeral directors at, at the funeral home in my apprenticeship. Oh, as really? Well. Okay. So, so right. we. What an interesting background. <laughs> I've had all kinds of jobs, but never thought of working in a funeral home. Yeah. So you worked there for a, a little while? or Several years. For several years, uh, okay. Met uh, a, a gal who was a nurse, and we got married. I have two children, one which lives in Cedar Woolley, Washington, okay. on the west side of the state, and the other daughter lives in Wenatchee, Washington, which is north central any, close any to home. grandchildren? I uh, have three grandchildren. All right, uh, Grandpa. So, uh, and they're, yeah, pra, pra, they're growing up, I bet you uh, are. And you're living in Omac, and, and for I'm, our listening audience, where's Omac at? Omac is only 40 miles south of the Canadian border, directly north of, of uh, Wenatchee, 100 miles. Okay. So it's dead, pretty well dead center of the state. So you so, got married, you're in the funeral business. Where are you mm -hmm. living at this point now? Uh, I worked at several funeral homes uh, across the state, one in Toppenish, uh, also another one in Stanwood. And then while I was in Stanwood, uh, uh, I went into the, er, with the urging of a couple people, I went into the insurance business and sold insurance for 22 years. Now, were you still working and, in the funeral home? No. I, so for, yeah. one, for a while, for several years, you're working in the funeral business, and then you back off and you get an insurance. Were you selling right. life insurance? Life and health. Life yes. and health. Well, I guess if you're so. working in a mortuary for a while, then life, ins ins life insurance and health insurance is a good follow-up. So how many years uh, did you, you do that? Uh, a total of probably about 20 years, okay. uh, 22 years in the insurance. And where, I were used you to joke where were you living at this point? In Mount Vernon, Washington. Okay, now you told and me that you went through a divorce somewhere along the line. Yes, uh, that was when I moved back to eastern Washington and to OMAC. Okay, and is this uh, after the was... 20 years of insurance? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. And so when I moved back to OMAC, I went back in the funeral business and worked in the funeral business again for another 10 years. And were you single uh, at this time? Uh, no, uh, within a couple of years uh, I married uh, a, a lady I had met and... Uh, and how did you meet her? I had uh, had the services for her second husband who passed away. That's what I thought. And, so and, you uh, were involved we, in the services for her husband yes. who passed away and that's how you kind of got acquainted. Right. And fell and, in love eventually. Uh, yeah, well, it was kind of almost love at first sight, but being professional, I tried to stay away from that type of situation uh, and... Uh, actually, and she f had feelings the same way because after we were married, she made the comment that that uh, she made several excuses to come into the funeral home to pay her bill or whatever. Just so she could see you. She could see me. Well, so, nice-looking yeah. guy and very so, friendly. And so anyway, yeah. you end up getting married. We were and, married. And uh, then what happened? We, You've we, been married for a number of years. We, we lived there for uh, over 20 years. Okay. Uh, and about uh, 17 years uh, after we got married, uh, I decided to semi-retire. We went to uh, a company making RV guest guides and maps for RV parks. And that was something she could participate with me. She also had helped, uh, you know, in funerals, conducting funerals and directing people and assisting around, you. you know, so yeah. as uh, under my supervision. Well, you told me so she had some kind of an illness. She, she in 2005, uh, started uh, falling over backwards and whatnot. We took her Losing to the doctor, her balance. lost her balance, and was having more and more trouble speaking. And we took her to a total of seven doctors. Uh, the seventh doctor was able to diagnose her we went through disease. six doctors, and they weren't able to really pinpoint what the problem was. Right. So what did the seventh she, one say? The seventh one said she had progressive supernuclear palsy, which Super is a... Supernuclear palsy. I've form, never even a, heard of it. Form of Parkinson's type. It's a type yeah. of Parkinson's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, did it come on quickly? Or did no. It, 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 it had been coming on since 2005. Okay. And he diagnosed it in February of uh, 2009. Four years later. And, right. Okay. And then uh, she passed away in, in September 
uh, oh actually, so actually she was diagnosed, not, and just a few months later, she yeah. passed away. So yeah. uh, she, she had some of the similar symptoms of palsy and uh, not so much shaking or anything, but but just the falling over backwards or her her like she couldn't walk over four or five feet. And Motor her, skills her were her legs yeah. would buckle on her, okay. and then of course she was having a hard time swallowing. That's the 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 balance and the swallowing are the two big signs. Now, of what that were you disease. doing? Were you back in the, in the in the funeral business at this point? No, we had uh, uh, seven years before she started coming down with this. Uh, we actually had started doing the RV guest guides okay. and had did that across the state of Washington, uh, one park in Oregon and one in Idaho, <clears throat> and then uh, after we. Uh, Retired, we went to Alaska to visit uh, uh, two of her children and, and three grandkids, and that's when we first noticed it that because she, was she started some problems started falling. Some of the symptoms so, were yeah. showing up. My. So that must have been pretty but, tough. Yeah. So we we tried to go back again in 2007 because her first grandson was graduating from high school and and one of the first kids in the family to graduate she, from high school, and so. She wanted to be uh, there for that. She wanted to go for that. We made it about a little over halfway up, and she just, she got so sick, we wound up turning home, oh. around and coming back home. That's too so, bad. Uh, so when she was but, diagnosed, she ran rather quickly then. Uh, yeah, in, over a four year period. Yeah. Well, yeah, over. She hadn't been diagnosed, uh, yeah. but for that right, period yeah. of time. Yeah, so, that's, that's too bad. Uh, and then, uh, we, uh, I started at, shortly after that, I started coming down to Quartzsite, Arizona in the winter with some good friends that uh, were from up there. Now, Quartzsite's out in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's about it's, 200 miles here from Loma Linda. Yeah, 200 but miles what, east. Tell me about Quartzsite. Well, Quartzsite is a, is a small community of about 3,400 people, but during the winter time, particularly in January and February, they have big RV show, big gym show and whatnot. And the population in some years has swelled up to a million, million and a half wow, people. Wow, so from 3,400 so, to up to a million. And I've right, been by the place and right. I know that all of a sudden people are camping all over the desert there. And, and particularly for a one week, one week period, eight or nine days, they have a number <clears> of different things going on and probably the largest RV show in the country. Yes. And they get almost a million people. Right. Well, so one your, of health, the, your health has been pretty good up to that point. Yes. All right. One of the other unknown factors of, of uh, Quartzsite is the music. They have tons of very oh, good they? music, jam sessions, the musicians. So people bringer. are really coming from across the country into this area and a big city, I mean a little, mm -hmm. little city, springs up out in the middle of nowhere. So your health has been pretty good, but then something happens. Uh, in 2010, I uh, was in to see my doctor from a regular checkup, and my PSA had, at that point uh, had gone up to 4.4, and so he thought Which it was... Which is not all no, that high, no. but it had gone up significantly, right. apparently. So he thought I should go see a urologist, which I did. Uh, I was having some other urinary problems and that as a result of the prostate. And at that point, then they did a uh, te did the test and found out that I did have. Uh, so they did one probably did a normal digital, and then they yeah. probably followed it up with some blood work or had the blood work first. Yes. And what did they find? They found out that in the uh, the tests that they did, I had about seven percent of one of the uh, needles showed. Uh, cancer they said it was okay and for, our, for our listening audience uh, when a man has a rising PSA it's an ind it's only an indicator but uh, yours have been rising and they thought there's something mm -hmm. going on so they did a digital and then they thought it was time for a biopsy mm -hmm. and there are biopsy. a number of different samples of, of biopsies that are taken and apparently in some of your biopsies they found some cancer yes all and, right and uh, with that the uh, urologist that I saw said, well, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, just wait and watch. It's nothing that's going to kill you right away. Or and that's probably that... you'll pass away from something else. All right. Well, and for, for many men, prostate cancer is a slow-growing cancer. And 
Watchful waiting, as some people call it, I like to prefer to refer it to as active surveillance, mm -hmm. is a viable option. Yes. But you found out you had the cancer, so what was your reaction to this? Well, my first reaction was uh, I wanted a second opinion. I, uh, you know, after having gone through what I did with my wife, I feel that uh, it's very important to be active in your own health care and okay, aware. That's a very, very important point for our listening audience. Right. You need to take responsibility for your own health care and you need to be responsible for it. And you mm -hmm. need to seek out the doctors. And right. So you had this burden so and the doctor, the, originally the doctor said don't worry about it, you're going to probably die from something else, you've got plenty of time. But because of your experience with your wife and all that you've been through, not just a few years before, but recently, you thought, well, I better get a second opinion. So what did you do? So I was coming down here at the time. I down here, you uh, mean? To, to Quartzsite, Quartzsite area, Arizona. And uh, a friend of mine had been down and seen a urologist that he thought was real good in Parker. And so I, it's Parker, Arizona. Arizona. Mm -hmm. I contacted him and uh, talked with him. Uh, he basically said, similar to the other uh, urologist, in the meantime, uh, my friend Bob and I uh, decided one day to go over to Wickenburg to a uh, barber that was an old classmate of his and get our hairs cut. And, and now uh, Bob is a friend of uh, yours. He's a friend. Uh, okay. I was staying on their property okay. and whatnot. And uh, he had a barber friend. He had a barber friend over in Wickenburg. Okay, which yes. is not too far away. No. So one one day we drove over to Wickenburg to get our hair cut. And when I was there, uh, laying on the barber's table with the newspapers and everything for people to read, was uh, Bob Marquini's book, How to Beat Prostate Cancer Without Surgery. Uh oh. And just happened to be laying it, there. Just happened to be laying, laying there. I asked the guy if I could borrow it, and he said, you can have it. And about the same time, I had, in my Christmas letter, had put a uh, one sentence or two in that I'd been diagnosed with prostate cancer and it was nothing serious and whatnot. And this is a letter that went out to family and yeah, friends? Yeah, friends. Okay. And one of the friends that I had met and, and made was a fellow from Walla Walla, Washington that was a manager of the uh, RV park that we did there. And immediately when he got it, he called me and he said, hey, Vern, don't do anything till I talk to you. He said, I want to talk to you. And he had been treated here uh, just six, eight months so before. So he had come to so, Loma Linda and yes. had been treated for prostate right. cancer. And he gets this so, newsletter and said, Vern, don't do anything. Right. Okay, and then did he did he so, talk to you on the phone he, or come over well, and talk to you? Well, or? we talked a little bit, but he at the time was visiting his son over in Mesa, Arizona, near Phoenix. And so I drove over one day and, and we talked. And, and, uh, and in the meantime, I'd had a chance to read Marquini's book and so it was a no-brainer, as I say, uh, to come to Loma Linda. I contacted Loma Linda, and one of the problems that I was having with my prostate was it was very enlarged. It yeah. was at 140 grams. That's and, very large. Uh, normal prostate. prostate's 20 to 25. Right. So you're three, four, uh, five times as much. They said that uh, they would like to see me, but. Uh, I needed to do something to reduce the size of my prostate. So my urologist put me on uh, Finistrad and Flomax. And a year later, uh, I was able to get the size down to 100. And two days after I uh, had seen him and got the report back from him, I immediately was in contact with Loma Linda. So and you took a couple they, of these medications that helped with the flow and also it reduced the size of the prostate. Yes. So as soon as it got down to a reasonable, manageable size, you called Loma Linda. Right. Then did you get a packet? I or? got a packet from them. I, I had some information previously because I had talked to them earlier and uh, uh, I felt that, uh, you know, somebody was guiding me, the good Lord was guiding me uh, uh, along well, those directions. Well, th this is a religious institution, as you know. It's a Seventh-day Adventist institution. Right. And we've been in the, we're in the healing ministry. We have hospitals and medical clinics all around the world. So anyway, you got the packet, then you came okay. down here. I, and so yeah. they, what, what did you do during your treatment? Well, Im immediately they, uh, I could have been 
in treatment or in for a consultation within uh, a week and and it took me a couple of weeks to get my place winterized in Washington because of the cold weather sure. up there and whatnot. So, but I... Uh, so this was I had the month a, of November, December then, a uh, few years ago. No, I, it was actually first part of October. First part of October. When I found it. So when I was time. I was here by the 9th or 10th of October, I think it was. Okay. And, and I had my consult and uh, I was extremely impressed with the doctor at the time because he went over the different options with me. And when we got done, he said, now what would you like to do? And I said, well, I've already made up my mind and it's here. So he said, wise choice. And, <laughs> and we went from, went from there. Okay. Uh, I had a fifth wheel RV and stayed at Mission RV. We have a and number of people that ended up staying over there. Yes, uh, I think there was eight or 10 people sure. there when I was there. And, and that was part of the camaraderie uh, amongst patients. Uh, all of those people are good friends still today. Now, people form lifelong yeah. friendships. Right. I often say the treatments take place either in the gantry or the fixed beam line, but healing is a process. Mm -hmm. And this, this building of friendship and bonding and developing support system, that's all a very, very important part mm -hmm. of it. So were you sick during the time you were here? I, I, was, I felt uh, good all the time I was here actually better, better by the time I left than I actually when I arrived. Uh, every day I was out doing something, uh, went went to some air museums, uh, the big Santa Bernardino Museum. Even though you were sick? Yeah. Even though you are being treated? Uh, many times would leave right direct from the hospital for from treatment and go out and do something, spend the rest of the day doing something, looking around, whatever. So. Did you take part in the Drayson Center? Yeah, uh, no, because I had uh, both of my knees have only about 20% cartilage. Okay. So. And you were I, by yourself at this point. Yes, and okay. I, I, I actually started out walking more, but I had to cut back on that because of my knee situation. So, and if I remember but, right, you were here in the month of December. Uh, I f yes, I finished and, the 27th and of December. And over Christmas time. And had the pleasure of having a fantastic. Christmas at the Martell home. <laughs> and, yes, uh, well, this is going to be our 15th year. And uh, the biggest year we've ever had was 85. Mm -hmm. And uh, every year we get Christmas cards from people that were there. But we're, so, we're really glad that uh, you're able to be there and take part. But now, since you've left, and since this is a number a few years ago, since you left, you've been very yeah. actively involved in helping others. Uh, discover about prostate cancer. Well, what have you been doing? One of my goals when I left was to see that as many people as I could uh, tell and, and inform to have proton treatment. And so uh, one of the guys that went through with me and two fellows that, that uh, went through right after me, we all started uh, and after we started our treatment, uh, we were uh, we got on a radio up there in, in Omac, Omac, Washington, and we uh, contacted them, had a half hour program, uh, and then we started, a, as a result of that, we started a, a support group. Great. And uh, we have met ever since, once a month, uh, in the morning for breakfast, one morning of, of the month. Well, yeah. now you were telling me you were even on a radio program talking about the work Cross that happened on here at Loma Linda. Yes, and sharing yes. Some, what happened? Uh, as a result of that, we had people contact us, and uh, and so we've, like I say, with our support group now, uh, we have uh, posters in some of the medical clinics and and everything and so we've we've really done st a lot of uh, oh that's that's reaching wonderful. out we're, to we're, people we really appreciate that so. that's one of the things we're trying to get started now is little what we're calling pods mm -hmm. all across the country we have people from around the world but particularly we're looking at this country here where we've had former patients that kind of get together and, and develop a fellowship and stay in contact with one another and with the institution. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, they're able to bring other people that have been recently diagnosed with cancer, not only prostate cancer, but other kinds of cancer. And 
put him in touch here with the institution. Now, uh -huh. this coming year, every year in Quartzsite, they have this big event, and I stopped by there last year, and you kind of gave me the idea about having an event there in Quartzsite. Mm -hmm. And uh, this coming year, we're going to have a, a, a booth there, and there's a, a, apparently during the month of January, they have anywhere from uh, 500,000 to a million people to go through there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have the, a booth, and you're going to help man the booth, and apparently you've got some other people that are involved. Uh, I uh, have contacted quite a few people, uh, have a lot of uh, assistants lined up, uh, people who are already uh, past p uh, patrons of uh, Loma Linda and been through the same thing I have. and So, so part of these people they, that are part of the Brotherhood they, of the Balloon, right, this organization right. started by Bob Marchini, yeah. are going to be able to come in and help. And yeah. I, we appreciate that. I'm going to be up there for several days, if not for the whole time. But what a marvelous opportunity. The booth will be there to just make a display about Loma Linda, not only about prostate cancer, but all the services offered here. Mm -hmm. And what a prime audience we have, people that are retired coming through there and uh, are beginning to face some of the uh, diseases that are so often with the older generations. Well, mm -hmm. I, I want to thank you, uh, Vern. I, w I want you to look into the camera as though you're talking to the listening audience there and tell them if they're diagnosed with cancer, what should they do? First of all, it's not a death sentence, it's a diagnosis. It, it's, but tell them what to do. It's not a death sentence. The first thing you should do would be to call Loma Linda and find out what you need to do to, to come down here for treatment and, and uh, look at it. Uh, since I have been treated, uh, I am now married. I got married last uh, December to a nice lady I met and so it's one of the it's good changed things. my life. <laughs> one of the good things yes. that come about as a result of coming to Loma Linda being treated and you got an extension on your life and a whole new outlook. Vern, I want to thank you for your part in helping us here at Loma Linda and looking forward to working together with you. And you know, for our listening audience, uh, one of the things we want to always tell people that have been diagnosed with cancer, get a second opinion. Definitely. You know, talk to other people who have had the same kind of disease. See what they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the listening audience, for those of you this week, that you may have heard some bad news. And I want you to know that God's got a plan for your life. And when you find out you have cancer, generally it's a diagnosis, not a death sentence. And I want you to realize that God's got a plan for your life. There's a wonderful text in Ephesians that said that God is able to do, 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 do above and beyond what you think or dare believe is possible. He's got a plan for your life. If you'll give him an opportunity, he'll open and close doors. And like Vern, an extension of life, wonderful plans for the future. Until next time, God bless you each one.